I'm Andrew Holt from City and State. Uh, just want to make one mention. The assemblyman is running a shade late, so we're going to shuffle him in if there's an empty chair. Um, the other couple of things is I want to thank our underwriters, our hosts, uh, the Stephen L. Newman Real Estate, uh, New York area, Con Edison, and Genon for their generous support. And a couple of housekeeping items. I want to mention the next two issues. Uh, next Monday is going to be New York Infrastructure Issue Spotlight. And relevant to this audience, the following issue on the 22nd is going to be Green New York. So I'm going to go ahead and introduce Emily Grace uh, as our host to give a couple of remarks and get started. Thanks. Thank you, Andrew. I'm pleased to be here this morning as I fill in for my boss, Jack Nyman, who is executive director at the Stephen L. Newman Real Estate Institute. My remarks cover both Jack's enthusiasm for the importance of today's event as well as my own. He apologizes that he could not be here due to a scheduling conflict. Jack has been very active in the area of energy asset management for the real estate industry as the principal investigator of a major grant funded by the U.S. Department of Energy and NYSERDA. The result was the recent creation of the Advanced Energy Performance Certificate Program at the Institute, an online professional development program for the commercial real estate market. He feels that today's conference is key to further continue the dialogue on the importance of the energy management issues for the real estate and business communities. The Institute takes pride in addressing issues of change within the public policy sector. Energy issues remain critical to the sustainability consciousness that the Institute fosters and continues to demonstrate leadership in after six years under Jack's guidance. But this consciousness has a broader effect, one that extends beyond just the government's important role in energy conservation on a variety of levels. The issue that this institute continues to pinpoint and address is the role of the public. The concept of accountability. That the logical extension of stakeholder actions can carry through to the big picture, to the tremendous task of addressing climate change and global warming. Today's conference is about what we can do in terms of public policy to influence positive change in energy conservation but it is also to highlight the initiatives that have already begun to take place by various agencies and departments represented by our esteemed panel. We want to thank city and state for today's collaboration and to reference what we hope will be the first of many such events between city and state and the Stephen L. Newman Real Estate Institute going forward. We must remember that a state without the means of change, without commitment and accountability, is an environment where conservation cannot occur. New York is a unique leader in our nation with exemplary initiatives that the world can follow. Such commitment and determination can already be found on various scales within the government, and we're happy to have those ambitions represented at our conference today. We'll discover that through public agencies such as Con Edison and through city initiatives like Mayor Bloomberg's Plan NYC 2030, ideas and actions can progress and inspire from the local to the national level and to our nation's capital. Part of the accountability that we foster at the Institute is recognizing that although we're not scientists, we are professionals. And we're here today to learn and discuss and understand the essential conservation efforts that can be taken through the public sector by tapping our own unique area of expertise. Energy conservation is the foundation of energy independence. And I think the commitment by the panelists today and by the sponsoring partners of the conference, city and state, and the Stephen L. Newman Real Estate Institute will show the accountability necessary to effectively address the planet's problems on a larger scale. And now it is my pleasure to introduce Richard Thomas, Director of the New York Affordable, Reliable Electricity Alliance. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. 
I just want to thank City and State and our esteemed panel for this uh, lively discussion that we're about to have. My name is Rich Thomas. I'm the director of New York area. We were founded shortly after the 2003 blackout, and our 150 plus members are concerned about three primary things, jobs, electricity prices, system reliability. And we believe that we have a strong economy that could get stronger with protecting our in-state generation and expanding our transmission system. Without further ado, I'd like to introduce the, the, the moderator of this panel this morning, Jonathan Lentz. Thank you so much. Thank you, Rich. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is John Lentz. I'm managing editor at City and State. I want to welcome you all today to today's panel discussion on New York's energy policy. And it's terrific to see such a great turnout for such an important, timely, and for many people, an emotional uh, topic. Uh, and I want to say thanks again to our panelists for taking the time to be here. I'll just briefly introduce them and we'll jump right into the questions. Uh, to my left is Jerry Kremer, the chairman of the New York Affordable Reliable Electricity Alliance. Uh, to his left is Congressman Paul Tonko. Um, then we have Deputy Mayor Cass Holloway and Kevin Lanahan, the uh, Government Relations Director at Con Edison. And first of all, I just want to ask all the panelists, and we'll start uh, with Mr. Kramer on my left. Uh, what do you see as uh, the, the most pressing issue in terms of New York's energy policy? Uh, where are we right now? And, and sort of what's the biggest challenge? In just a few minutes to start out. Well, <clears throat> I think the best way for me to describe it, everybody's focusing on, on whether Congress is going to go over the fiscal cliff come January 1 of next year. And I think we've reached the fiscal cliff here in New York. Uh, the following events, we have today's New York Times article, which indicates that the prospects for hydrofracking are dramatically being challenged as to whether it's ever going to happen in New York. Uh, you have the debate over Canadian power being brought in to New York State. You have the uh, intense effort to close Indian Point. Um, you have, uh, the, there's an effort going on now to close down coal plants in New York State. Uh, the more you get into this whole issue of what's New York's energy presence, not future, the more you realize is, is that we are without a long range plan, we're without a short range plan. There's no doubt to the governor's credit that we've now embarked on the energy highway but the energy highway is a very long toll road with a lot of issues and a lot of potholes that we're going to face before it happens. We passed the siting law finally, thanks to the efforts of people like Paul Tonko when he was in Albany to get something going, but there hasn't been a rush on the part of out-of-state investors to go create new facilities in New York. So when you think of it, we have on one side of the ledger, we have almost nothing being offered that provides immediate help. And on the right side of the ledger, we have all these crises that are boiling up, which point to the fact that we just don't have the potential energy sources to keep us going. In addition to that, the New York ISO, the system operators, have projected that there will be 1,725 megawatts of power that's going to be retired in the next couple of years. So what are we doing about replacing what we have? What are we doing about creating new sources of energy? And the answer is, candidly, for New York State, nothing. To the administration's credit, they have embarked on this energy highway program, and that will produce results, because there are a lot of people who are interested. But right now, there's very little on the table, and we have reached the energy cliff in New York State. John, uh, let me uh, perhaps put this in the context of a bigger picture where uh, I believe we need a national plan on comprehensive energy. Um, I ran for the seat in Congress because of what I saw as energy chair of the New York State Assembly for 15 years and then transitioned over to NYSERDA, the New York State Energy Research and Development Authority. There I saw policy implementation. I saw the emphasis on the benefits of efficiency, uh, the benefits of research that enable us to get more bang for the buck for every dollar invested. We need it with our renewables. We need to find out how we can shave the price uh, factor. Uh, simply by investing in research. Um, as we transitioned um, as regions and states across this country from a utility-driven model to more wheeling of electrons, more shared opportunities between regions, states, and now countries, um, wheeling in the potential of hydropower from Canada, we need to have in framework 
uh, a comprehensive energy plan. New York obviously has had better leadership, I think, in getting some of these issues addressed. But as we transition, I agree with Jerry Kremer that we have to look at the, the mix of the future. And we know a healthy mix will embrace diversity. Uh, we need to make certain that we shape the demand issues by having investments in efficiency. The, um, the efforts there, when you look at what's happening or not happening in Washington, uh, raise serious questions. You know, we started off in my first term with the establishment of ACES, which was an American clean energy agenda. Did really well, took a lot of effort to get some of the coal burning states to uh, buy into the concept. Uh, but then it faltered, and now we're into this situation of a cut mentality with no investment seen as important. Uh, we're struggling with the sequestration issue in Washington, where cuts, huge cuts are proposed for domestic investment. We need, at this time of transition, to have that investment so that the interconnection that we can enjoy um, from renewables that are established is real. We need to make certain that we discuss the production tax credits to provide certainty and predictability uh, for the markets out there. All of this federal policy can ripple effect into what happens or doesn't happen in New York, uh, making certain that we don't cut programs like weatherization, uh, which have been tremendously strong in addressing the needs locally, but also affecting the mountain of electrons we require as a society. Um, you know, to have seen that cut from a peak of 200 million down to what is 86 million is a very telling scenario. So we have to get real, I think, about the investments. Those are the challenges facing every state and the nation. We need a comprehensive energy plan. How can, as an, how can an economy as great as the American economy, which still is very much um, a strong force in the international scene, not have a comprehensive energy plan? So I think the languishing uh, out there for that plan is one of the severe shortfalls uh, for um, any state because of the failure from Washington to really put uh, the big picture view into a more predictable, secure, stable um, outcome that uh, is sustainable. Mm -hmm. Cass? Uh, well, maybe going from the national to the uh, more local, um, uh, Congressman, uh, thank you. It's an honor to be on the panel. John, thank you very much uh, to city and state. I think uh, when we look at New York City, I'm the Deputy Mayor for Operations, what does New York City have to do with energy policy in New York? Well, it turns out we're, we're not a utility. We don't regulate the energy sector uh, except for some issues at the margins. But we do have to ensure the integrity of the infrastructure here, uh, the reliability of that supply. And I would say there are three goals for New York City when it comes to energy policy. We want it to be uh, reliable first and foremost clean and affordable for New Yorkers. Um, we have a great partner in Con Edison uh, who is here in terms of reliability and also other utility operators like National Grid. Um, and we work with them on a day-to-day -day basis, really, when it comes to uh, making sure that the energy infrastructure is, Assemblymember, how are you? Um, uh, making sure that the, the, it is reliable. But I think the mayor has um, really taken a strong position to support infrastructure investment coming into the city that's going to bring new energy supply. So there are two important projects that are moving forward. One is the Spectre Energy Pipeline uh, that's going to come under the Hudson. The other is the Williams uh, National Grid Pipeline that's going to come through the Rockaways. The Senate uh, last week just took an important step in finally passing the legislation necessary uh, to ensure that that Rockaway Pipeline can come through. What are the stakes? Well, that gets to the second issue of, of how clean is the energy supply and how reliable is it? First, in terms of reliability, there hasn't been new natural gas supply in New York City for 40 years. 40 years. Um, and uh, one of the, uh, and why is it important to the Bloomberg administration that that change? Well, one of the major announcements that the mayor made in 2011 was that we were going to clean up one of the dirtiest parts of the energy sector, which is heating fuel. Turns out that there's, we're still about 10, now we've had about 1,000 conversions, so it's about 9,000 now. But as of two years ago, there were 10,000 buildings in the city's building stock of a million buildings still burning number six and number four heating oil. Together, those 10,000 buildings, which is 1% of the city's building stock, uh, generate uh, as much particulate matter, 2.5 PM, as all of the cars and trucks in the city of New York combined. So uh, we passed regulations that uh, gradually phase out 
by 2015, number six. Um, number four has certain requirements that phase it out, uh, and people need to switch to either natural gas or number two. Now, those regulations are a backstop. We thought that if we could achieve, we asked the question, what would, it, what would we achieve if we were able to get 50% of the volume converted by the time Mayor Bloomberg leaves office? That doesn't mean you have to do 5,000 conversions. You just have to convert some of the a smaller number of the largest users. Turns out you, uh, you would save more than 120 lives a year just by making those conversions. So we announced the Clean Heat Program, which is working again with Con Edison, uh, a program th that has created and we have generated more than $100 million in, pub in private investment to help um, buildings and incentivize buildings to convert uh, to natural gas and to number two um, uh, fuel. So that is a, a, a major thing that we're doing in, to make sure that energy supply is clean. Now, there are other elements of the supply. We basically are taking a, a strip. People say, well, what about renewables and, and, and what about having that in part, as part of the mix? We put out an RFP a year ago to bring solar power to Fresh Kills Landfill. There are only eight megawatts of solar in New York City. Uh, now, that's uh, 400 times more solar than there was when Mayor Bloomberg took office, and that's a good thing. But I think that uh, anybody would look at that and say, uh, we can do better. Uh, the question of whether we can do better, though, really depends on policy. Are the right incentives in, in place for solar to be a really viable commercial level uh, type of energy investment in, in New York City and New York State? This is one of the questions. Uh, and we're going to see if, uh, if that is, in fact, something that uh, if we can generate 20 megawatts of, of solar energy at, at Fresh Kills, that would be tremendous, in addition to it being one of the signature parks. Um, and we're also doing things in wind, so that's clean. In terms of affordability, I think uh, people in this room know, and New Yorkers certainly know, that uh, prices uh, have, uh, there have been a lot of constraints uh, and things that have made things difficult. One of, the, one of the good stories is, in terms of the economics of energy in New York City, the prices of, of natural gas has actually gone uh, from a consumer's perspective in the right direction, which is down, uh, which has also incentivized uh, people to make this conversion to natural gas. That's good for public health. Uh, it's also good for greenhouse gas emissions. Um, soon, within the next week or two, we will be releasing uh, our, greenhouse, our annual inventory of greenhouse gas emissions, and I think everybody is going to be pretty impressed with the results. Um, it, it, we will see that the city has made significant progress towards the mayor's commitment of reducing GHG emissions in, in New York by 30% by 2030. So uh, reliable, clean, affordable, that's what New York City needs. Um, and uh, excited to be here and talk about it. Okay. Uh, John, thanks for the invitation. And um, this is, I'm flattered to share the microphone and, and the discussion today with uh, the Assembly Energy Committee Chairman, Mr. Cahill, and, and Congressman, Mr. Uh, Tonko. This, the first job that I had out of college was working for a small uh, upstate newspaper that happened to be in Mr. Tonko's district. That's how we got to know each other. This was more than uh, 20 years ago, I, I guess. Uh, I hate to admit it. But, um, and if he remembers, the Gordon Road Bridge was the biggest story of the day. It connected two communities to the only uh, route to bring fire and ambulance service. Um, I was covering that story. That's how I got to know. Uh, the congressman and then eventually worked in the assembly. He taught me everything I knew and working with Kevin, I've learned a, a great deal more. Um, you asked what the most pressing energy issue is. It, as, as we've heard already, it's hard to pinpoint one. Um, and I'll, I'll be brief, but I think, you know, if we look at uh, the last decade or so since deregulation, it's been a challenge for Con Edison, it's been a challenge for the utility industry, policymakers. Um, if we go back even further to the uh, 20s and 30s, the previous century, um, there was a real focus on just building and reliability. Now, um, there's more of a focus on the whole host of options that we can bring to customers. And as technology has advanced, um, our customers have gotten more sophisticated. They understand what they want. Um, and what they want is their electric utility to offer them everything. They want to make sure that, um, th that the power they're getting is, uh, as we've heard, reliable, affordable, and clean. They want, um, they want options to install smart grid technology, which we've done, um, that makes the, the grid smarter and safer, 
Um, we can pinpoint outages. We can isolate those outages with this technology. Uh, we can uh, see what customers are doing in terms of usage, and that teaches us how to uh, address uh, what to build on the grid. Uh, they, there's on-bill financing, which uh, Mr. Cahill helped uh, institute in the state. Um, so you, the customers can now use their energy bill to finance energy upgrades at, uh, and efficiency um, projects at their home or their business. Uh, we have dem demand response programs uh, that are more rigorous and fruitful than ever before. We can talk to uh, residential and commercial customers, tell them to reduce load in times of high heat and stress. So uh, we have, uh, I'll also mention too, um, a pretty rigorous program with residential customers to identify what their energy needs are, how that they can use less, we'll install, and, and these energy surveys are free. We will install free uh, compact fluorescent lights. So we're doing more than we ever have. We've got options for customers that were never anticipated uh, maybe even 15 years ago. The, the, the question though is um, what makes sense in terms of affordability and cost? and then what makes sense in terms of cleaning up carbon. Uh, that seems to be the main thrust of many of the programs and many of the policy debates that we hear, both in DC and in Albany. Um, and so it's our job to help be a resource with policymakers. And, and a lot of the uh, programs that I mentioned either began as ideas in Congress or with discussions at the city or the state level. Um, and so at the same time that we want to be energy advisors, and, and help customers understand their usage, provide the products and services that they want. We also want to be a resource to, to government and continue that conversation. Um, and so that's, I think, you know, part of the, the balance between affordability, bringing new products and services, cleaning up the environment, and maintaining the grid in uh, cooperation and coordination with all levels of government. And I also want to welcome Assemblyman Kevin Cahill. Um, the question is, what's the most pressing energy issue in terms of energy policy in New York State right now? Thanks. And thank you. I'm sorry for being late. I uh, took public transportation down here and the mirror fell off the bus. Uh, <laughs> the, the, the most pressing energy issue of the day, of the moment, of the year, depends on who you ask. If you're in an upstate community, western New York community, Rockland County, some places, in the Hudson Valley, the most pressing issue is how do we convince people who already own power plants to repower them so they don't lose their real property tax base. If you're part of the generator community, uh, the, the most pressing issue is how do we, I think this is the most pressing issue, is how do we move power from one part of the state to the other to make it affordable and how do we make sure that where we have power existing in our load pockets that, uh, that a market is, is available to them that makes it viable to, to, to operate. Uh, if you were to ask uh, the city of New York, of course, the, the question is how do we get more power into the city and how do we make sure that it's safe, clean, and reliable? Um, actually, when you get down to it, that's the ultimate question everywhere. By the way, if you were to ask my mom what the most important energy issue is, it's making sure that her son gets reelected to the assembly. <laughs> so, so it is a very personal issue. It is truly a personal and individual issue. Um, and, and I will tell you that I think that if I had to sum it up and if somebody asked me what drives me every day when I'm working, um, I would have to say it's getting it right. I think that's the most important thing, <coughs> getting it right. We don't quite have it right. We don't have the balance right. We don't quite understand the, the comprehensive nature and the, and the interplay uh, of the entire system. And uh, there's a lot we can do and should do. We have delayed the introduction. Uh, the Energy Planning Board has delayed the introduction of the Comprehensive Energy Plan, the, the draft plan. That's a mistake, in my view. Uh, we supplanted the transmission study for it, and we want to incorporate the transmission study into it. That's a good thing. But delaying the, the overall approach, the, the comprehensive look, is, is a bad thing. Uh, that's how we're going to get it right. We're going to have to know where are resources, where are needs, where are our assets that we can put to use, and where are some assets that we ought to be looking again at and, and trying to find another way to use them. Uh, we ought to find out where, where are the gaps in our policies. And that's what we've been trying to do since I've chaired the Energy Committee, taking over after a guy who really knew what he was talking about, other than, see, I'm not an engineer, I'm a lawyer, but my predecessor was an engineer, and he was, he was learned, and everybody who walked into the office knew that they were facing a formidable um, source. That was Mr. Tonko. <laughs> so 
Uh, it's a very different world when they walk into my office today. People come in and they provide me with information, and what I determined early on was that uh, we needed a system. We needed a permanent, reliable, and dynamic system that was going to make our energy system comprehensible and comprehensive. So uh, where would I start? I would start by finishing the comprehensive study and, and getting in place those, those devices that are necessary to make sure uh, that it can keep going. From there, I would identify the specific and, and, and individual uh, issues that have already been articulated and already out there and, and need some push. One of the things that could use a serious push, and Kaz referred to it already, is making solar more uh, affordable and making it more realistic in places where it makes sense to have. And by the way, the place where it makes the most sense to have is the city of New York. Uh, what else would I do? I would fix this transmission problem as quickly as I could because it's silly that we have plants in upstate New York that are going to close their doors for the lack of a market, and we have a downstate market that's, that's wanting additional power. I would once and for all try to get down to earth on the issue about two very hot button subjects, fracking and Indian Point. It's time to have a civil discussion about it, not a, not a partisan, not a, a, a discussion where we're off on, on, in our individual camps and we're just declaring war on each other, but let's talk about it again in, with a comprehensive look to, uh, to uh, what New York's energy needs and possibilities are. So the sum and substance of it is getting it right. I think that's what we ought to be focused on, whatever it takes, whether it's Plan YC, whether it's the transmission study, whether it's comprehensive energy planning, uh, having a, a rational look at Indian Point and fracking and all the other issues that we face, getting solar on board, uh, getting it right, I think, is the key. Well, let's talk a little bit more about hydrofracking. That's been in the news the last couple of days. It seems that um, it's going to be extended even longer, the, the Cuomo administration's review. Uh, there's some concern that maybe politics are coming into play too much here, that it's just taking too long and uh, the Cuomo administration's reacting to all these comments and all these protesters. Um, do we need to do something to, to make this more of a concise process, sort of, you know, we know what the next step is and we're just going to have clear deadlines, or, or is it sort of going off the tracks a little bit here? Oh, I don't think it's going off the tracks. I, if anything, I think we should have done the comprehensive health study to begin with. This should have been uh, contemporaneous with the DEC review. And, and if we had done that, then we might not be looking at an additional period of time to do that study. Many of us in the assembly under the leadership of Bob Sweeney have urged that for several years now. Uh, what we don't want to do is go into fracking in a way that endangers something that is even more precious than than below market price natural gas, and that's our water. Uh, we set one standard right out of the gate. They set one standard for the uh, watershed of New York City and Syracuse, and then they said, we'll work on the rest of the state uh, separately. Well, every part of the state, every time you dig down into the ground, that's somebody's aquifer, and it matters very much to them and their families. We have to do it safe. That doesn't mean we shouldn't do it. It means we should do it as safely as possible, and we should take lessons from other states where, where it's been done wrong and figure out how we don't do it wrong again. So if it takes a couple more weeks, a couple more months, even a couple more years to get us on track with fracking, as long as we're doing it right, it would be great to supplant that 95% of natural gas that we're importing from places like Dimmick and Dish and, uh, and Louisiana and going over 1,500 miles of pipeline that gets recompressed every 50 miles. It would be great to have a, have a more environmentally friendly natural gas source, but uh, we can't go uh, headstrong into it. Now, Congressman, I, if, um, on a federal level, um, uh, uh, first of all, any other comments you have on that, but then also, is the federal government doing enough uh, to regulate hydrofracking? Uh, well, let me try to answer both of those then in, in my comments. I concur with what Kevin just said. I believe, like many, that we're going to transition from an oil economy to a water-based economy. Um, if that's the case, if that happens in the next 10 to 20 years, um, New York State is poised for tremendous potential. Uh, we're the link between a great ocean and the Great Lakes, the largest compilation of freshwater um, bodies in the world. Um, why would we jeopardize that? So there's a way to move forward scientifically to make certain that we protect a very precious commodity that allows us great strength into the future. Uh, beyond that, I think we need to uh, be aware of the impact on local governments. The byproduct of that process is immense amounts of water. And I don't think that there's federal policy that enables that uh, to happen well enough. There has to be, I think, a resource pool 
that is made available for the retrofitting of water treatment facilities. I don't think there's many communities in upstate New York that could bear that sort of burden. Um, and there should be, uh, I'm part of the, uh, the Hinchy Bill, that would talk about public awareness of chemicals that are introduced in the process. The communities have a right to know. And I think there are, you know, a lot of I's to dot, a lot of T's to cross, scientifically, to take us forward. That's not to deny a process. It's to do it correctly and um, in a way that will provide the greatest strength for our future as we transition to a water economy. But do you think we can go forward with fracking at some point? I think with the right bells and whistles, if it's done with all bits of science taken into mind, we could move forward. But um, I think the situation right now has a lot of people concerned. And I think that um, you know, sitting on the Natural Resources Committee, um, we only dwell on drilling opportunities. I've had to vote uh, for or against a number of drilling bills that just constantly keep coming up. That's the only emphasis. The, um, the lack of comprehensive energy thinking, along with that comprehensive energy plan coming out of Washington, is holding us back. I'm going to comment. What I find mind-boggling about this debate is the fact that hydrofracking has been going on for 65 years throughout the country. Number two, there are 14,000 active wells in New York that are vertically drilled that are currently in existence producing money. There are states that have been doing hydrofracking for years and are eating New York's lunch every day of the week by virtue of the fact that they're getting enormous amounts of revenue. Pennsylvania next door is having a good belly laugh at New York State because of the fact that they have the benefit of all of these processes going forward. So in a sense, we want it to be safe and we want it to be secure, but they're talking about New York hydrofracking was this new invention that's never been tried anywhere in the world and that New York is unique in and of itself talking about hydrofracking when in fact there's got to be and, it, and there is a vast body of evidence that currently exists about the Pennsylvania experience, the Ohio experience, the Texas experience. And it's really interesting. I just find that the more discussion there is about the new things that have to be looked at, uh, from my perspective, are just another part of the group that doesn't want nuclear, that doesn't want hydrofracking, that doesn't want coal, that doesn't want anything. And I think from my perspective, uh, the industry uh, is going to turn its back on New York. And I don't expect hydrofracking to be on any substantial basis in the years to come in this state. I think that debate is almost over. I think the delays are going to make it uh, a, a non-starter. And from my perspective, uh, this whole thing uh, is, has been overblown and over-exaggerated. Now, Cass, Mayor Bloomberg has uh, been outspoken on this issue and has tried to position himself sort of in the middle. Can you talk about uh, the importance of natural gas to New York City and sort of where the Bloomberg administration sees hydrofracking? Sure. Uh, and I think that um, the uh, congressman and assemblyman have uh, laid out one fact, which is the is this issue is complicated. Uh, there are a number of, of things that have to be addressed. I don't share uh, Mr. Kramer's uh, pessimistic view. I don't think that the industry is going to turn its back on New York. The, um, there is a very practical import to this question for New York City. We recently uh, put out a study that, that we did, which showed, and the reason we commissioned this study was because the clean heat program that I described in my opening remarks, if a substantial portion of the city, and many of them happen to be in your service territory, convert to natural gas as part of moving away from dirty fuels, um, the overall demand for natural gas in the city could go up by as much as 30 percent, and in certain areas it'll exceed 50 percent, and we know we just don't have the infrastructure or the supply to meet that demand. Um, that's not to say that it would be even better if the energy source could be uh, purely renewable, but we know we're not there yet, um, so at least there needs to be a significant bridge period um, and natural gas is going to fill that gap. Um, what our study showed was two things. Um, one is that natural gas is already um, a, a dominant source of energy in New York State. And, and the future, when you look at the trajectory of where it is coming from, and, and I encourage people to go to nyc.gov and take a look at this, is going to be from uh, the Marcellus shale and shale sources. That is just the reality. So whether it comes from um, New York State or Pennsylvania or other parts where the shale play is, 
the, that is, so we, we have to deal with that reality. And what the mayor has done is what he does in most, uh, all of these cases is, let's get the facts. What do the facts suggest? And then what can I do as mayor? And then he all often doubles down and says, what can I do in my, wearing my other hat, my philanthropic hat, to, to help advance this cause? And um, he and George Mitchell, not the, um, the uh, famed negotiator, but the father of fracking George Mitchell, uh, recently wrote an editorial that ran in the Washington Post where the mayor announced that the, their foundations combined are giving uh, millions of dollars uh, EDF, the Environmental Defense Fund, is one of the organizations that has gotten one of these grants to organizations to put together what the right set of regulations, what the ideal set of regulations should be. Uh, there are some key issues that have to be addressed. There's the backflow issue that the congressman identified. There's um, methane emissions, which um, our study also showed. We looked at two things. What does the natural gas supply look like? Um, and what are the life cycle emissions of the natural gas process, and it turns out that one of the key uh, determinants that makes natural gas um, from a fracking, fracking sources less desirable is um, the extraneous methane emissions that are a, a very powerful greenhouse gas. But the good news is these things can be controlled. Um, these uh, emissions can be reduced, and if you do that, the data that we have so far, and more research is being done, and EDF is part of leading the way to do it, uh, shows that the emissions profile and the, the environmental profile of natural gas um, clearly beats coal already and ultimately will beat other types of fuels decisively. Uh, the question is, are we going to put the right regulations in place and do it safely? Uh, the mayor's view is that that can be done. Um, I think that, uh, and, and now uh, with George Mitchell's help saying to the industry, look, you guys, you got to get serious. Don't pretend this isn't a problem. It is. Um, but I think we would all like to see, uh, you know, people get together, agree on that fundamental premise, and move forward because, um, you know, the energy is needed, and we need to make these investments. Um, so it's a, uh, it is a com complicated issue, but I think there is a way, uh, a way, a navigable way through it. Now, Assemblyman, <coughs> Assemblyman, you've talked a lot about uh, solar and the need for investment there, as well as conservation efforts. Do you agree with Cass that um, there is this bridge period where we need natural gas, and, and one key part of that is hydrofracking? Well, if we continue on the path that we are on, there's no question about it. Let's be clear about one thing. Uh, one, one, one aspect of the natural gas industry that's taking off like wildfire is the consumption side. We're developing more and more needs. As we talk about whether Indian Point continues to stay open, we're not really talking about many alternatives that are not based upon natural gas. Well, there are a couple, but not many. Uh, when we talk about cleaning up our fleets, uh, our, our tractor trailers and our buses, uh, we're talking about converting them to natural gas. We're not really talking about making all electric highway-based vehicles. Uh, no matter where we're talking about it, when we're talking about state-of-the-art power plants, we're talking about combined uh, generation facilities. So we're on a path where we are increasing our reliance on natural gas. We already count on it for about 65% of the power, and uh, that, that's only going to go up. Take a look at what else is happening around us in, in other parts of the United States that we rely upon. PJM, which Kaz and I have had many discussions about a line coming into uh, Midtown Manhattan about. Uh, that's a system that relies primarily on coal. Unfortunately for PJM, right now they're in the process of deciding which coal plants to close. So the whole dynamic of the industry is changing. So we cannot ignore the, the very uh, uh, primary reliance that we have on natural gas. And as I say, if things continue to go as they're going, we're going to increase that reliance. Do I think it's absolutely necessary that we do so? No. Um, we have two energy sources that we do not exploit to the same extent that we do uh, fossil fuels. And that's renewable, renewable energy, solar, wind, hydroelectric, low head hydro, 2,500 megawatts sitting out there that used to be used to make stuff that, that isn't used to make stuff anymore around New York State. And then, of course, the, the, the silent giant is energy conservation and efficiency. We can do so very much with energy conservation and efficiency. And I honestly do believe we can fill the gap with both of those. In the meantime, there's no question, the industry, uh, conventional thinking in government, um, the way things are developing, demand side, it's going to be natural gas. 
Now, I know there was a, a push last year and maybe the last couple of years in Albany to uh, have more investment in solar energy. Yes. And I think Con Edison's been on the other side of that issue, had some concerns yeah. about costs. Uh, could uh, the two of you talk about that a little bit, sort of what, what the status of that is? I know there's a New York Sun initiative that the governor put into place, and then there's a push to, um, I think, extend the time frame to give more certainty to industry. Go ahead, Kevin. So uh, uh, first and foremost, Con Ed is very supportive of solar investment. In fact, as we speak, uh, we're sponsoring a conference at Fort Irving Place uh, downtown uh, that brings solar developers and customers and uh, manufacturers together. There's a networking component so that we can get these groups together, um, but it's also to help educate uh, these people on the application process, how to uh, expedite it. We have um, an ombuds person at Con Edison. That's all this person does is uh, work with the developers and the applicants to bring um, the application to fruition in as speedy a time as possible. Um, so if you, uh, you want to place solar array on your home or your business, you come to us, we'll help put all the pieces together. Um, we have to look at renewables by and large and, and solar specifically in the context of affordability because it is the most expensive renewable investment. Um, wind is a uh, little more affordable. The most, and, and, and Mr. Cahill just mentioned this, the, the most affordable um, investment we can make in reducing carbon, cleaning up the environment, and, um, and reducing usage, and therefore strain on our system, and, then, and avoiding capital investments, costly capital investments, is energy efficiency. So we, we focus uh, a great deal of energy on energy efficiency. I mentioned earlier we work with uh, large and small com uh, commercial customers and residential customers, identifying where um, the strain is, is and the demand is most on our system, target those areas. Uh, when, when you look at the uh, ability to reduce carbon emissions and tonnage compared <coughs> and compare energy efficiency programs to renewables, it's not even close. Uh, that said, we understand that uh, policymakers and, and customers are interested in solar. There is a benefit. We have to keep in mind, however, that it is intermittent, and so we need to balance the costs, the ability to, to use that uh, resource at any certain point uh, during the, the day. Um, and our peak demand is greatest at 5 o'clock on. That's when the sun happens to be going down. Um, with a, an approach that, that takes all sorts of generation in, into, uh, into consideration, um, we talk about oil to gas conversions. That is second when you look at uh, the cost ratio in terms of uh, what you're able to do reducing carbon. That is the second most fruitful uh, endeavor. Let's, let's talk a little bit about the Solar Jobs Act in particular. That's what I want to get at that I think the Assemblyman has pushed for. All right, so I'll, I'll, I'll take 20 more seconds. Okay. So the, the bill, as we've looked at in, in the legislature, would mandate utilities to buy long -term con enter into long-term contracts and buy great amount of solar or compliance credits uh, that we think are going to be costly to customers without a, a great net benefit. Well, I want to give Kaz a chance to talk because I know he wants to talk okay. about the extensive program New York City has for energy conservation and, and energy efficiency. But to address uh, Kevin's point that he, that he just raised, virtually every one of the proposals that have come before us in, in our transmission studies and, and how we're going to address New York City, perhaps in a post-Indian point environment, um, have, have required of us to entertain the idea of a power purchase agreement. There's nothing different about that, whether it's natural gas or solar. It's all the same. It's a question of who's going to get paid and how are they going to get paid. The Solar Jobs Act, which is the latest iteration of our solar proposal, um, would provide a system that would be designed by the regulators, as opposed to having something mandated by the legislature. In the, in the previous uh, versions of the bill, we said, let's have a credit system where we would essentially make it so that the market would come to a level. Uh, there's, there's a lot that can be done, and there's a lot that will be done. The question is, what energy source are we going to use? It's not a question of whether we're going to do it. We are. It's, it's a question of what energy source are we going to do. And in terms of affordability, um, I hark back to the mid-1950s and Robert Moses' decision to replace a privately owned uh, hydro plant 
in, uh, in Niagara Falls with a publicly owned one, and then to require two million upstate residents to buy that power at three cents a, uh, a kilowatt. And, and, and that requirement was cost prohibitive to those upstate residents, but they did it. For about seven years, it was cost prohibitive. Then it became cost effective. I think the same cycle that happened with, uh, with hydro uh, over 50 years ago, we can see again with, uh, with solar. Gas? Uh, well, so there's so so much here. Uh, let's just uh, thank you, Assembly, for mentioning the uh, the efficiency. Efficiency is absolutely critical to any um, any long-term energy strategy or plan at both the federal level and in the state. And New York City is investing heavily in energy efficiency. One of the one of the data points that um, will become clear in the in the, the greenhouse gas emissions report that we're going to release is that. As between 2005 and 2011, overall consumption in the city has basically remained flat. Uh, but we know over that time that there has been substantial, uh, I mean, th there hasn't been as much growth as I know some people would like, but uh, certainly there has been growth. Part of the reason that it, that has remained the case is because efficiency is really penetrating the marketplace. The city, in terms of its own power consumption, is investing 10% of its energy budget on an annual basis in doing retrofits. Uh, for energy efficiency, and that translates into more than $80 million a year. As somebody who's been involved in making sure that those investments get made effectively, um, I can tell you we've, um, we've definitely made progress there, but there is, there's, a, there's another side to this. We are going to turn on a water filtration plant, for as of the former commissioner of the Department of Environmental Protection, um, and an ultraviolet disinfection plant that are going to increase New York's, uh, that, just that agency's energy demand by almost 50%. Uh, there are people in this room, and I'm thinking of Richard Anderson uh, here from the Building Congress, who would like to see New York City grow even faster than the projections, uh, which would mean that even with efficiency, you're going to see as people come in, and Plan YC predicts there's going to be more than a million new people here in New York City by 2030, they need power. New York City is going to need power. So um, it's not a question of whether efficiency, these things aren't mutually exclusive. There must be a robust um, efficiency component to the, the energy plan, certainly for the city and for the state. Um, just a, a note on solar, I think that um, we've done LIDAR analysis. You could go and there's a really cool map online. Again, go to nyc.gov. Uh, there is tremendous potential for small, medium, and even large scale solar development in New York City. I think um, the people in this room, look at one particular indicator. Uh, we have a request for proposals out that's on a rolling basis for the next year to develop about 20 megawatts of solar at Fresh Kills Landfill. Now, there are all kinds of issues with this. Can we do the interconnection with, that we would need to deliver that power? Um, are the incentives in place so that somebody is going to make the infrastructure investment necessary uh, to build that solar? Uh, if, if it turns out that we are able to get a, a viable uh, investor there, which is one of the best places for solar in New York City, um, that will be a good thing. If we don't, or if it is something that they do simply as a marquee project or because they want to, you know, we want to put something there to say that X company is um, doing solar in New York. The question is, well, how do we need to change the incentive structure so that that's not the case? I think that the Assemblyman's point about, you know, it becomes cost effective over time is really the point is uh, about scale. The, the more there is, the more there will be. Um, and uh, I think right now, uh, as much success as we've had with solar in New York City, and again, I like using the percentages because a 400% increase between 2002 and 2012 uh, sounds pretty impressive. The only thing is that really is now is 8 megawatts. <laughs> so uh, on the peak day, what did we do this summer? Um, in, uh, uh, I, in July, I, I watch for the peak day every year. We had 29,000, 13,000 megawatts. We, More we, than that. 13,500 13, megawatts. 13,500 megawatts. Yeah. We have had a peak load day in New York City every summer that has exceeded the prior year's peak load day um, every year that I have been uh, part of the Bloomberg administration. Um, and I can tell you uh, that demand, uh, as good as efficiency is, um, Peak load is what you need to be prepared for, um, and we need as many sources as possible to deliver it. John. Sure. Go if I, might. I think that uh, you know any of the policy that is established or the resources that are put into the framework of a budget really express the, uh, uh, the priorities of society. And we really need to engage this new thinking in a way that stops the mindless handout of subsidies to the oil industry that is creating this imbalance 
um, for the consumer. And there is potential to invest in research for renewables. There's potential to invest in renewable development. And there's a potential to invest in battery, advanced battery manufacturing. That's the linchpin to all of this. You know, in my district, in upstate New York, GE is developing an advanced battery that will be able to store renewables. So the incremental um, uh, uh, aspects of it allow us to go forward with more reasonable uh, use of renewables in that context. That new investment that's required in research of batteries, research of more um, efficient renewables that can shave the pricely, uh, priceliness of it, those are important factors that ought to be addressed by making these funds fungible, sliding them over, because all we're doing is now adding to the profit column of historically rich oil industry types. You see a lot of it going to administration. There's no development of new opportunity for the consumer. And I think large grade <coughs> renewable efforts ought to be addressed through tariff and rate making. It's time for us to get bold in the initiative and to uh, make certain things happen and see energy efficiency as our fuel of choice. You can you know, in, uh, invest in these efficiency models by, again, using subsidies that are now mindlessly handed to um, an industry for nearly a century. Now, at the federal level, there's been, I think, some debate over the wind energy tax credit about renewing that. I think it'll be expiring soon. Um, right. Where is that at? And, and then also, is that sort of the wrong approach by, by sort of breaking up different energy and not having it sort of technology neutral? There are those who would be happy to have that just be sunsetted out of existence. It will come up probably in the lame duck session. It will be part of the big tax reform debates that are going to be conducted. But production tax credits need to be made certain. They need to be made predictable. We need to provide out there uh, an atmosphere of can do simply by putting a framework that is long term and meaningful into play. And um, there is a struggle. There's a struggle now with the whole sequestration issue because the sub super committee couldn't get um, an alternative developed so that we're going to cut trillions into a domestic agenda. And if the majority in the House has its way, they'll cut even more deeply to give more money to defense. So it's time for us to establish priorities as a society and say this is the emphasis that we want and get it done and get moving. Now, it seems like energy policy is stalled in some ways at a federal level and at a state level. What's holding us up? What can uh, make us move forward? Deep pockets. He's right. I mean, I, what, the, New York has yet to send a positive message to the investment community outside of New York and in New York that it's time to come in and put in serious amounts of money into new energy sources. And until that happens, until those deep pockets are convinced that we mean what we say, that we're determined to get it done, that this is a place that's open for business of all kind, until we've gotten that message across, the deep pockets are not coming. I mean, we, the, the citing law was passed a year ago, and I've waited to see the murmurings on the part of the investment community that we're ready to jump in. That hasn't happened yet. The energy highway is a way now to flush out potential cash sources. But right now, we don't have it. We're not doing anything to really get it moving. And hopefully, it's going to happen. But that's, I think, the critical part. Now, and to that point, John, think of it. In August of 03, we had a major impact that caused South Canada, New England, Northeast, Midwest, Eastern Seacoast to be in the black. All do during that time, there was huge emphasis on homeland security and fighting terrorism. Well, what a gaping vulnerability that moment presented to any terrorist mind. I mean, there was a weakness, a fundamental weakness in our delivery system, our TND. And, you know, branches in Ohio put the lights out on Broadway in New York City. It caused tremendous damage for small businesses that realized a lot of losses. And since that moment in 03, has there been a real debate about transmission upgrade, interconnection, making certain we can wheel efficiently? We're still dealing with a system that was designed for regional uh, modeling. And we're, we're talking boldly about shipping electrons, wheeling them, wheeling them from another country to us. That dramatic. But we need to invest in the infrastructure. I want to offer the other side of the coin to what Jerry said about people not running to our 
borders to invest. Um, I think a much more significant reason why there has not been new investment in New York State for transmission infrastructure, for generation uh, capacity, and a few other aspects is everybody's pretty happy. They're making money. That changed over the past couple of years, but until very recently, people were doing okay. You know, if you own a transmission uh, system that had congestion on it, it made a lot of money in the summer by having congestion pricing on there. If you own generation and you had more people that wanted to <coughs> buy it than, than uh, there were people willing to sell it, you made a lot of money. We're, that is absolutely changing. You know, I remember the healthcare debate with my friends who are in the medical profession, and they had virtually no interest in healthcare reform until they stopped to making money. Once they stopped making money, there was a motivation for them to get interested in health care reform, and now, now they're in there by the truckload of people who were concerned about it. Again, if we had a comprehensive planning process, one that, and, and one that was dynamic and understood all the components of what was going on, we could plan for a much larger picture, and we could find a different balance that wasn't based upon somebody making a killing and somebody else getting whacked. I think that's a wrong approach. Cass? Uh, I, I think just to add even one more layer of complexity to the issues that have to be addressed here, if you look at um, the incentive to invest and bring new transmission, uh, new capacity online uh, is uh, ch challenged um, by even the rules and the regulation at, uh, between the independent system operators and FERC. One thing that New York City faces right now is for one of our new plants, the Astoria 2 energy plant. Um, we may find that uh, the Energy Regulatory Commission is going to say, well, you are not going to be able to sell that energy into the grid um, at a rate that is going to be profitable without what's so-called mitigating to protect incumbents who are already in the industry and, and burning, uh, creating energy with, at, with dirtier sources. That's a big victory for incumbent producers, um, and we're appealing that decision. But uh, it's something that certainly dampens if it doesn't stop the incentive to invest in repowering that is clean, uh, new plants that are clean, uh, combined cycle plants. Um, and so this is a very serious set of issues. There's very powerful interests who, uh, as I think we were saying, are, are not interested in seeing um, the capacity uh, of energy in this state expand. And also we have people at the, the federal, the state, and city level here today. Uh, to what degree is that um, fragmented nature of, of policy making, is that a challenge and, and in what ways does that work well? And maybe Congressman, if you could start. Well, I think it's a challenge because of um, people needing the certainty in the equation. And without a comprehensive energy plan um, for the country, what states do independent of each other creates more complexity. And, you know, again, because of the change that we've introduced, we are interconnected in final outcome format, but without the comprehensive energy plan, there's not that sustainable outcome or that predictable and certain element that will drive investment. So I think we do need to have a comprehensive energy strategy. You know, for many in the room, they're aware of what the prediction is in Washington that we'll be pulling out the carbon piece, we'll be pulling out the particulates, we'll be pulling that out and doing some other energy pieces and not being comprehensive in the outcome. And that is, I think that's a setback. Is there a if failure of leadership with uh, President Obama on energy policy? Oh, I don't think it's a failure of that leadership. I think it's a resistance by sending progressive policy to the Hill. You know, we were working on ACES and now they're gutting some of these things. And it's a situation where uh, even committees are coming up with some antiquated thinking, in my opinion, I where mean, they just want to drill their way out of a situation, and we're not going to be able to do that. We need a comprehensive strategy. We need diversity of fuel mix. I mean, what do you think we could really get uh, with the next president? I mean, it seems like cap and trade was on the table, and then Obama didn't really push forward with that. Romney or Obama, what do you think we can realistically get in the next four years in terms of a real change in energy policy? I think that there's probably going to be a huge um, focus on the transmission issue, perhaps an infrastructure bank bill that will enable us to address some of the investments we desperately need as a society. Um, you know, some of the activity with the stimulus package proved that there's far more interest in some of these investments than even the stimulus. I mean, it was just a down payment. We saw a lot of application made for 
new thinking, and we just need to embrace that. We're educating and guiding some nations out there that are developing their infrastructure for utility purposes, and we don't seem to use any of our own tools to advise us and motivate us. So uh, we need those new models to take hold. John, just one thought on this. I, um, in, in the uh, 80s, we owned oil-based generation, and there was uh, the oil embargo of the 80s. We were weeks away from running out of oil. If there was ever a time for a comprehensive national energy policy, or if there was an impetus for it, that was it, right? Um, but we haven't had one since then. I think, to, to be fair, um, it's very difficult to form one uh, because this, the needs in, say, the western part of, of the country in Nevada are very different than they are in New England or, or the Northeast. Um, and, and so Congress, I think, then is almost constrained to, to figure out where there's purchase on um, getting their arms around what fits one size fits all and where that, that um, might work. And clearly, it's, I keep going back to it, but I'll echo it again, on the energy efficiency side. And the President, a few weeks ago, uh, issued an executive order that he wanted to achieve uh, 40 gigawatts of energy efficiency nationwide, and he's going to do that through um, combined heat and power. I mean, those are the things, I think, that um, the federal government and Congress can really make a difference on. It's very difficult to say uh, we're going we're to form a one-size-fits-all and each state is going to be able to achieve their goals uh, under this prescriptive plan. Okay. I think we've run out of time. We're going to take it to some questions from the audience. So um, I think Jasmine will be walking around with a microphone. If you could raise your hand if you have a question. I should get to introduce yourself. Okay. Um, John Rappaport with Component Assembly Systems. Hey, Cass. Um, and a great panel. This is just tremendous. We do uh, walls and ceilings and insulation on many buildings. Barclay Center, the World Trade Center. A lot of uh, how buildings are built, installed, and assembled in terms of what are the best practices that should be done in spec specs and scopes of work for subs especially. Uh, Con Ed and other advisors and how we build and the incentives to private and public owners to build correctly and measure energy in these buildings because LEED really has not worked out. I think the part of the reason is you don't measure from LEED as much as you can. So the question is, how can we get the building industry to get on board? Richard Anderson unfortunately just left. I did talk to him the whole. Cass, do you have any comment on that? Well, the good news is there is a, uh, in 2009, the administration and working with the city council passed what is, uh, I think, the signature green buildings law in the country that required for um, residential and commercial buildings that passed a certain threshold, annual benchmarking. Um, and the administration just released uh, the bench second annual benchmarking report and what it showed. Uh, and what, what that provides really is um, a window into how are certain building stock performing in terms of energy efficiency and where can you make efficient investments to try to reduce consumption and get more out of what you're using. And it showed that there is a, the, the most efficient buildings are five, three to five times more efficient than the least efficient buildings. Um, and so, you know, that is just a very high level. Uh, if you look at building classes, um, it turns out that some of the older building stock, uh, because of how it's constructed, and this makes a lot of sense if you look at how the Empire State Building was built versus some of the glass and steel towers today, um, they, they actually perform better on certain efficiency metrics. Um, that doesn't mean we shouldn't be building um, glass and steel skyscrapers. We, we should, uh, and the more the better in New York City. But, uh, but I think it is uh, it, the, one of the calculations that we came to was if you could try to get some of those worst performing buildings just to move towards the mean in terms of their efficiency level, making certain basic changes to, um, you know, boilers and uh, energy insulation, some of the basic things that you're talking about, um, you could actually uh, reduce uh, greenhouse gas emissions by up to 20 percent. So uh, that benchmarking requirement, I think, is the beginning of, and it, this is a, not a one-time deal, this is, this is going to continue um, uh, going forward. And I think that uh, the most powerful, one of, one of the most powerful um, things that uh, a, any 
building owner, investor, somebody who is going to move into a building can have is information, which now they can have it. There is demand in the city for, for so-called green space. Companies want to move into buildings that are um, efficient, that are thinking about and acting on these issues. They're efficient. They recycle. They are, uh, if you look at the, you know, the, the I would call the gold standard, uh, the Durst uh, Bank of America building, done incredible things and looked at it comprehensively, not just in terms of energy efficiency. Stormwater, um, they compost, they do, you know, the, and, and the good news is there's demand for this. Now we are creating through law and regulation the transparency that's needed so that people can act because the city or the government is not going to be able to. There are 950,000 buildings in, in New York City. Um, what, what we need is there to be momentum built in the public and the private sectors to make these changes. Uh, and uh, I think we're headed in that direction. Just two more questions. Um, Rob Watson with uh, Ecotech International. Prior to um, founding Ecotech, I founded the LEED Green Building Rating System. Um, and it, in, in 25 years of market transformation experience, not only here but, but overseas, it's the thing that I find most effective is when you combine regulatory push with market pull. Um, I see a lot of impetus on the market pull, um, but perhaps not as much in the regulatory push. And neither works well without the other. So I'm just curious, for example, you know, why don't we have a, uh, a retrofit law? Why don't we have uh, you know, a, a regular improvement in the building codes, not just whenever the heck we get it around. I mean, we're like two or three years behind the NEA, for example, on, on electrical components for safety. Um, it seems to me that, you know, uh, more of a push on the regulatory push side would complement things like LEED, like the Plan YC, and, um, you know, it seems to me that Con Ed would also be in favor of, uh, you know, a little bit more certainty in what demand were uh, occurring if, uh, you know, we had more certainty about what was coming out of the pipeline in terms of building consumption. Well, I, we'll, we'll don't want to dominate the Q&A, but just a quick couple of thoughts on that. First, I, I would uh, dispute the idea that, um, that there is, uh, that there has not been a tremendous regulatory push uh, to uh, do all kinds of um, important things in this area. Just the building code generally, massive redo of the building code in 2008 and then a commitment by the administration to do three-year annual reviews. The third one's coming up. We just did a massive uh, upgrade to the plumbing code. And we have made major changes. There's basically an energy code now in New York City where there was not, and I can send it to anybody who wants it, um, that requires uh, certain levels of uh, efficiency in the way that, um, that new buildings are built. Retrofits and the extent to which retrofits are required, uh, obviously an issue. I mean, you, you, you know, there's, there's always a balance between cost, cost effectiveness, and, um, you know, what, what you want to achieve. And New York City's building stock uh, is as much new building as there is. Um, most of it is uh, already existing, and it's going to be here for a while. Uh, I think you, you are seeing um, steps taken, and certainly the benchmarking bill um, is a, applies to everybody. Uh, uh, where we go with that, we will see. Um, but I think that there have been some, some uh, important and, and groundbreaking uh, steps that the city's taken in this area. Of course, we can do more. Um, we'll see where we go.